Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the third lecture in our um, postgraduate lecture series. Um, so firstly, the acknowledgement of country. Um, we acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations as the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and recognise their continuing connection to country and community. We pay our respects to elders both past and present. So today I have the pleasure of introducing Professor D David C Commander, who will be giving a lecture on inflammatory signaling and ubiquitin. So David is a world renowned figure in the field of ubiquitin signaling. He moved from his previous lab in the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge to WEHI in 2018 to assume his current role as the division head of the ubiquitin signaling division and the head of the Commander Lab. The research interests of the Commander Lab include a focus on deubiquitinases, mechanisms behind both protein and non-protein ubiquitination, and how ubiquitin signaling plays a part in diseases such as Parkinson's disease. Aside from fishing for answers to the big questions in science, David also enjoys getting out in his kayak and fishing for actual fish in the sea. So anyway, without further ado, um, I'll hand the podium over to David for his presentation on inflammatory signaling and ubiquitin. Thank you, Felicia. All right. Um, thank you, Felicia, for this kind introduction. And uh, it's uh, funny to be back up here. Um, I'm always a bit scared of these talks because these home crowds are always the worst, you know. So these are people that you have to meet after you actually, you know, leave the lectern. Um, and uh, these are really the most stressful talks you can you can give, I think, as a scientist. Um, but I'm actually going to have fun today uh, because I'm going to go through a lot of work that we are have that we have done over the past uh, um, couple of decades on the ubiquitin system, and um, I'm going to give you sort of a uh, perspective here. And I really want to use this time to really alert you of this beautiful, beautiful ubiquitin system that we continue to study. And you know, if somebody would have told me, like, you know, when I when I started the ubiquitin system and I was a postdoc and I on my postdoc interview, um, my you know to be boss uh, David Barford basically you know, said to me, look, you know, these kind of that's all very nice and fine, but. I think this ubiquitin thing is really something you should look at. And I really have gotten so excited about this, even while I was writing my PhD thesis about what was next and what wasn't known and all of these things, that it was really beautiful to um, to immerse myself. Um, and, you know, just really literally last week, uh, Saturday morning, I got up at 3 o'clock in the morning and I was my head started spinning around the data that I'd seen the day before. And... So I, I still lose sleep over ubiquitin, you know, and that's, I think, some, a testament to what what, uh, what you will hear about. So I'm going to give you an intro into the ubiquitin code uh, from a very ubiquitin-heavy perspective. And this has really been our approach uh, in the last two decades or so. Um, I will mention some of the problems that I don't understand. So, you know, if you've got an idea, please let me know. Um, we've used ducks to really inter to interpret the ubiquitin code. and I will show you some of the data that we've, we've used uh, them for. Um, and then I'm not really sure I have lots of time for this. But I also really want to give you ideally a bit of techniques and tools at your fingertips so that you at least know about them if you should ever come across your big and, and practices. And then um, I, I have a, dub, uh, um, a little bit of information as well. Talk about Ultralin, but really this is a pretty uh, ubiquitin heavy talk. I managed to put this together yesterday. I realized that okay, actually there's no time to talk about any of the dubs and viruses and bacteria. And I just, you know, we are working on this quite a lot, but really there's no way to, to do this any justice. So I, I won't even try. Okay, ubiquitination. This is modification of typically lysine residues. Um, this is a protein called facilitated by E1, E2, and E3, uh, activating, conjugating, and ligating enzymes. And you've heard a lot about this. So I'm not going to reiterate all of these things here uh, about how they work. There's many other people in the building that can do this better. Um, 
For us, one of the most interesting features is the fact that ubiquitin not only comes as a mono ubiquitination, but also often forms polymers. There's ubiquitin receptors that recognize ubiquitinated proteins, the ubiquitin on the ubiquitinated proteins, and then there's the ubiquitinizers that can reverse the ubiquitination events and, and turn this all back. And really, the system is very typical for post-translational modifications. Kinases and phosphatase system is the best studied one. And uh, you can sort of see even the numbers sort of are roughly similar. Um, you know, this number is being corrected at the moment by Becky's lab uh, to be quite a bit higher than 600. But still, you can sort of see there's always many more things to put stuff on as compared to things to take, take it off again. So what's the big deal here? What is the interesting piece um, about ubiquitin? Well, this is what ubiquitin looks like. It's a small protein. That's the lysine residue that's ubiquitinated. The ubiquitin is attached to it via its C-terminal glycine residue. There's a glycine-glycine motif at the end, which is covalently attached to the lysine. And the cool thing about ubiquitin is that it has seven lysines itself, and it has a free end terminus. And all of these blue balls, all of these amino groups can receive ubiquitin and be ubiquitinated. So this then gives rise to ubiquitin chains. And um, it turns out that if you break open a cell, any cell that has ubiquitin, you can find all different kinds of ubiquitin chains. Um, it turns out that you can find actually all types of ubiquitin chains that, that, uh, that are present, that you can make. And it really also turns out, and that's a very important um, um, a message, that the different ubiquitin linkages are specifically assembled by E3 ligases, recognized by ubiquitin receptors, and unmade by dubs. And I'm going to show you the, the dub part in a second. Um, so really, what is very important is that don't ever say, oh, my protein is ubiquitinated. I want to know what type of ubiquitin is attached to your protein. Okay, this is a very, very important thing that because you have very, very different types and very, very different outcomes here that, um, that, that, uh, that, that determine this. So just to say, oh, it's all ubiquitin um, isn't quite enough anymore. So but what I'm really trying to say here is that, okay, we, we, we have the possibility to really form all of these different types of, of ubiquitin chains. Um, um, unfortunately, of course, in the cell, this is not color-coded, right? So um, what we have here is a system where four ubiquitins always have exactly the same mass, always have exactly the same composition, and the only difference is how they are connected, how the ubiquitins are connected to each other to effectively turn lysine 63 chain into a lysine 48 chain. It gets a little bit more complicated the moment you start to think about ubiquitin chains beyond two, because then you can actually make mixed chains where you add, or well, basically extend the chain from, from one linkage type to the second linkage type. You can have branched ubiquitin chains where you basically have one ubiquitin that is ubiquitinated on multiple sites to, to make a branch. Um, and then, of course, there's all other kinds of possibilities because we are still talking about proteins, right? So um, there's, for example, things like SUMO and NET8. SUMO and NET8 are small ubiquitin-like modifiers that can be ubiquitin. SUMO can be ubiquitinated and ubiquitin can be sumo -related. So there's a lot of crosstalk between the different translation modifications. And then, as I said, ubiquitin is a protein. Lysines can not only be ubiquitinated, they can also be acetylated. Arginines can be undergoing modifications. And, of course, phosphorylation is also happening on ubiquitin. I'm not going to talk about this at all today. So, uh, one word about ubiquitin-like proteins, because this is another thing that you might come across in your studies, right? Um, ubiquitin is one out of of a number of small molecules that have the same folds and are attached in an E1, E2, E3-like fashion um, compared to NET8 and SUMO1, for example. And then there is these other modifi modifiers, ILG15, which actually is like ubiquitin, but it has two ubiquitins. So it's like a little bit like a linear diubiquitin chain with two ubiquitin-like molecules linked to each other. But again, same story, ILG15 is added to proteins. And um, 
agenda is this one, FAT10, and I wanted to bring this out here because of the inflammation aspects here that, I, that is really fascinating. Right? So IG15 is interferon-stimulated gene 15, very important in any viral infection, and many viruses target IG15, which is obviously not saying that you know, it's good for the virus to target it. Uh, it must be doing something important in viral infection. And what I also find very fascinating, although we've never worked on it, is this protein called FAT10, and it's especially here a slide for all the immunologists in the room. Um, so this actually um, stands for HLAF adjacent transcript 10, which is uh, localized in the MHC class 1 locus. And um, it's expressed and induced uh, in the immune system, but only then, and it acts as a special degradation signal in the immune system. So this is really interesting, right? So there's a, 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 this is actually called ubiquitin D, right? Just, uh, just as an old name. So there's a ubiquitin-like modification here, restricted to the immune system. There's a single lab working on this in Germany. Um, uh, uh, Markus Göttrup, and he unfortunately passed away, um, I think, two years ago now. So this is like a massive untapped field of science that, you know, I think must be doing something else. This must be something doing very important in the immune system, otherwise we wouldn't have it. So, you know, fascinating um, to, to think about this. So what is interesting is that all of these uh, different ubiquitin-like modifications that are attached to lysine residues. Um, they have different C-terminal residues, so that distinguishes them. So many of the enzymes that work on SUMO, all of the enzymes that work on SUMO don't really work on ubiquitin, typically. Uh, and again, you can sort of see FAT10, you know, has a very different C-terminus. So really it has to have a completely its own assembly machinery, Hoover machinery, and so on. So it's it's a pretty big system to, to, to start with. So um, what we've been very interested in and what the field has sort of been moving into um, in the last decade or so was modifications on ubiquitin that are not ubiquitin. So for example, phosphorylation. We've done quite a lot of work on this. You might remember the works that uh, some of uh, my, my student here is doing uh, some on pink one, and other people in the lab are doing on that now. Uh, the other thing, and I think that's really the kind of stuff that really uh, excites me a lot right now, is this idea that ubiquitination is now not only found in lysine but we actually have it on um, serine saline So serine saline ubiquitination that has been described. Then, because now we are talking about ester linkages, we can actually attach the ubiquitin to, for example, on the PK here. Um, you know, so it's not entirely clear which of these is uh, ubiquitinated. Um, sugars, lichens, are ubiquitinated, and that's something we are very interested in. You might remember the talk from Yuri a couple of weeks ago only, uh, talking a little bit about the idea that all of these um, non proteinations Ubiquitination events might include in glycans. And then we have uh, modifications on phosphatidyl uh, acetylamine, so lipids. Right? So we really have no idea right now how deep, how, how, how big the system is. And that's the beauty of it, right? because that really tells us there's so much more to discover. So in my lab, uh, really pretty much from the get go, we've always taken a little bit of a uh, different approach to your standard way of, of being. Um, so, I think Alma is playing up a little bit. Would it be okay if he actually switched to the main? Sure. Mm -hmm. No worries. There you go. Okay, I hope this works. Um, so, the um, the way that we've attached the, uh, attacked the ubiquitin system is really with a very ubiquitin-centric approach. The idea and the mission of the lab is that we want to understand the ubiquitin code and we go into the system backwards. So we look at the signals first and then we try to understand what makes the signal. Um, how can we make, for example, these specific ubiquitin chains? How can we write the code? How can we read the code? What's recognizing these chains? And how can we um, destroy and erase the code uh, through the deubiquitinases? And by doing that, we basically have to, you know, already have a lot of enzymes to deal with. And I, I will talk again. I will talk a lot about the dots. 
But um, the new frontiers that are emerging, for example, with phosphorylation, really it means we also need to look for kinases and phosphatases. Acetylation of ubiquitin has been described. We don't know anything about acetyltransferases. So this at the moment is a massive uh, black box of, of enzymes and proteins to be discovered. And this is now going a little bit historic, right? Because I just want to show you where we came from, okay? So when I started my lab, when I did a postdoc, um, there were two ubiquitin chain types, K48 chains, K63 chains. K63 chains were discovered. K48 chains are the, the typical chain type that people got Nobel Prizes for um, to, to you know, do the, um, um, the degradation uh, chain types. Um, the first chain type, K48. And then in 2000 or so, K63 chains arrived on the on the um, on the on the scene. Um, so, what was clear when we looked at the structures for these chains, and this is crystal structures, but NMR structures had been done before this, uh, was that these ubiquitin chains look very different from each other, and that really explained. You know, I can immediately see how a protein can recognize this one and not this one, and vice versa. Um, in, in the first work that we've done in, in my lab, um, sort of started from my postdoc work, uh, we basically um, put the, another chain type, the linear chains, into the mix here. And we realized that when we looked at the dubs and the ligases and the binding domains, we immediately got a lot of specificity back. So there were lots of enzymes which really didn't bind K48 chains, but only K63 chains. Or there was even one that we found that was only binding linear chains and not even K63 chains, although the linear chains look very similar to the K63 chains. So there was a lot of preferences. But of course, the problem was that this was preferences for three chain types, and we knew there was going to be more. So really, we had to analyze all ubiquitin chains. The trouble was they've never been made. They didn't exist. We didn't know the enzymes, how to, how to work with this. And this really became the first, um, the first big task of the lab, right? We really needed to make the tools. And again, right, you're only as good as your tools. You only understand as much of the system as you have the tools for it. Um, so these were gels that we were able to run um, probably back in 2000 and nine or 10, end of 2010. Um, and you can see now all the different types of ubiquitin chains. So what were the, what were the breakthroughs? First of all, UBE2S um, was an E2 enzyme that we realized when we looked at, when we characterized it carefully, that it actually made K11 chains. So there were enzymes we could easily pick up from the freezer. People had clones and we had expressed them. And when we looked at what they made, they actually turned out to make totally different chain types that nobody's ever studied, okay? Um, we were able to use chemical biology, and this really, so these sort of papers came out uh, in 2010, but chemical biology now was able to make all of these different ubiquitin chains for us. And that was a big breakthrough too, because suddenly we ended up had, having all of these different ubiquitin chains in the freezer, and yes, they were chemically made, but you know, we had evidence that they existed in, in cells, so that was okay. Still, chemistry is one thing. It's nice to have chemistry and help you make your tools or chemical biology, but we still needed to understand what the enzymes were. So NLEL was a bacterial enzyme that we, that a um, student in the lab found to make uh, K6 chains, and we used that for making K6 chains. Um, and then UBE3C and RL1 were, were um, these three ligases, hect these three ligases that we used to make um, K29 and K33 chains. So all of these ligases and, and proteins are the first enzymes to specifically or less specifically make these new signals. And um, so this was fantastic for a tool aspect, but it also immediately showed us, look, if we have an enzyme that makes K29 chains, K29 chains is probably doing something very important because otherwise we wouldn't bother making an enzyme for, for something like this specifically. And NLEL actually is, a, is an enzyme from a bacterium, like from a pathogenic E. coli, right? So bacteria know everything about the system, okay? They make an enzyme which has specificity for K6, K48 linkages, right? So something about this linkage combination must be, must be uh, special, otherwise bugs wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't worry about it. So um, with this, we basically ended up 
you know, and having like the full set of enzymes that would allow us to make these chains. Uh, K27 chain, that's a bit of my my issue, right? I mean, we haven't we haven't made K27 chains yet, and those in my uh, division will know that there's a big challenge out there if you are the first person to make a K27 chain and thematically the whole division goes for dinner. Okay, so that's 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 a that's a rule here. Um, but that's really one chain type we we have still haven't figured out. So um, and here just to basically mention that you know what do these chains do? Well, you know a ton. I could spend another three or four lectures just going through the individual things that that have been found. But overall, um, we really don't have the resolution to associate specifically chain types with particular functions. Um, and I will come back to some of the details here uh, a little bit later. So what do we do with all of these chains? Well, let's cleave them again, okay? See what we can do with cleaving them. So the next part, I'm going to give you an introduction into deubiquitinases, which are really cool enzymes. What do dubs do? So we need dubs in many, in many, in many pieces. We need dubs to make ubiquitin in the first place. You know, ubiquitin is not expressed, translated and expressed as monoubiquitin. It's actually coming from a polygene. You know, UBB has nine copies, UBC has three copies, completely changes in different species. And then ubiquitin is actually expressed as a fusion tag with some of the ribosomal proteins. That's actually really just a solubility tag to help these proteins fold, I think. Um, and in order to make monoubiquitin, we have deubiquitinases, special deubiquitinases that effectively cleave these things to, to replenish our free ubiquitin pool. Um, dubs are very important because you know ubiquitin is a degradation signal. A protein is ubiquitinated and it normally goes to the proteasome. Dubs can rescue that and can effectively stabilize the protein and, and turn the ubiquitin back into the pool. Um, at the proteasome, however, if a protein arrives at the proteasome, the ubiquitin is not co-degraded. It's actually released from the substrate and recycled. Okay, so there's three dubs sitting on the proteasome to effectively um, pre-process and sort of um, um, deal with ubiquitinated uh, uh, targets. On the other things, we have lots of ubiquitin events that are non-degradative. And here, we basically have dubs to halt signaling processes, and we basically also have dubs which might not take the entire ubiquitin chain off, but maybe just to turn a polyubiquitinated protein into a monoubiquitin. That's ubiquitin editing, and that's happening as well. So there's no reason for dubs to cleave ubiquitin one by one, right? An opposite, actually many dubs release chains and we have specialized dubs to make sure that we never see in a lysate, in a cell lysate, you never see polyubiquitin. You only have a big fat monoubiquitin band because of all the dub activity that deals with all the released chains. So what kinds of dubs do we have? So um, we have uh, at the moment seven families of dubs. The biggest family are the USP enzymes, then we have OTU enzymes with 16 members, and a number of smaller family uh, and classes. So, um, you know, the last dub has only been discovered in 2018, the last human dub, all right? So this is really, uh, I wouldn't be entirely surprised if we've missed quite a few, some. Um, and right now, you know, so we have lots of ways to, to discover them. Bioinformatics has been very important here. Um, you know, right now the number is 100. You know, I don't think it's going to be go, go much, much higher, but, um, you know, we also really have no idea about many of the other ubiquitination events that we might have to deal with. So maybe there's other dubs. Um, where are these dubs? They're actually anywhere you look. Right, so they, there's a lot of them in the nucleus where there's a lot of ubiquitin, there's a lot of them in the cytosol, but really on every single cellular compartment, in every single um, um, uh, associated with any kind of cellular compartment or, or cellular situation, you will find your specific uh, dubs. So let's go a step further into this and let's understand what dubs actually see. Right? So this is a polyubiquitin chain on a substrate. So now on this polyubiquitin chain, 
we have very, very different ubiquitins, right? We have a distal ubiquitin that is not further modified, internal ubiquitins that are ubiquitinated, and then there's a proximal ubiquitin, which is attached to the substrate. So here we have K63 linkages. Um, here we have a, an isopeptide linkage to a substrate. So this is always identical, right? K63 chains, they always bind to K63. This one here is completely different every time because the substrate is completely different every time, right? So ubiquitin in a chain, ubiquitin linkages in a chain are not identical. Okay, um, I was going to say some things that I really don't understand, and here's, here's one of them. Um, how is it possible that anything in a cell actually finds a ubiquitinated substrate? Right, so I call this the, the, the concentration problem, right? So um, why would any protein, whether it's a ubiquitin binding protein or deubiquitinase, ever bind to a ubiquitinated substrate if the concentration of ubiquitin is so high, right? I don't get it. So let's have a bit of fun. How many copies are there of a typical protein in a cell? Average for MOSFET, any guesses, anyone? Come on. Steve, come on, what do you think? 20, Not bad, 50,000 on average, a good number. How about ubiquitin? How many copies? 500,000. It's a bit underestimated. 80 million, <laughs> right? So how is this working, right? 80 million copies per cell. On average, we have 50,000 copies of the protein. We have, on top of that, never, never is all the protein always ubiquitinated, right? That's a very important point too. Usually we always say, oh, you know, 1%, 5%. So that's not, so think about the numbers. It's completely crazy. So this is, a, a, a paper from a really good friend of mine, Mike, Mike and Sylvie, uh, really good friends of mine. And Mike is really into all of these, 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 these numbers here. And I completely stole this whole um, exercise from him, by the way. Um, and what Mike really has done is he's went into uh, um, this, this system, sorry. He, and basically um, there's these fantastic uh, uh, MUSPEC uh, papers to understand here the demographics and the actual numbering of this. And this is really what what he what he what he came up with, right? What he came up with. So um, this is a this is a big problem, and we really try to come up with ideas um, um, how this works. So I won't go into the first one here. Ubiquitin changes upon attachment. This could be possible, could be important, but we don't really know can't measure this very well. But actually, one thing that I think is very important is that it might be we might look at ubiquitin binding domains in a very uh, wrong manner at this point, because we are only looking at ubiquitin binding domains to bind ubiquitin, but maybe we should look at these domains also as binding the substrate itself. So really having um, a, a bi bipartite interactions. Um, and um, you know, um, we've worked on this and Simon Scott's is still working on, on, uh, on systems here where we really see now for the first time when we look at ubiquitinated proteins, that the ubiquitin binding domains really seem to recognize both the protein and the ubiquitin. And that would, of course, then generate specificity here that would allow you to, 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 to turn ubiquitination events and make sense of them, I guess. Um, and then the other thing, and this is something that, again, is a really interesting structural biology point, you know, ubiquitination of proteins, we don't know anything about what this does to proteins, right? We, we have no understanding what this means for the proteins itself. So ubiquitin, um, there was actually a, one paper that basically says, oh, actually ubiquitin starts to unfold proteins, which is good for the proteasome. You know, I totally lost the story, but you know, again, this is sort of um, just, just an idea. And why don't we know this? Because we, might, we can't make ubiquitinated proteins very easily, right? We just, we just made all the chains and even that we struggled with for a long time. But, um, you know, we basically are, are in, a, in a position that, we, we are not in a position to look at this structurally yet. 
Okay, let's come back to this picture here. Um, this is a K K63 chain. Now this is a K48 chain. So here we have another problem, right? Because look at this chain. How can anything ever bind to this, right? So especially if you think about a deubiquitinase. So this is now in yellow. You have a deubiquitinase, a USP enzyme. Ubiquitin sits here. The C-terminus goes into the catalytic site, and you can see there's even a bridge over here. So this and this is not the same thing because here the chain has to completely open up. So what I want to say is like all this structural biology work that we've done and others have done about ubiquitin chain really isn't, don't take it so seriously because we know that these ubiquitin chains are highly dynamic. They are flexible in nature. Um, it turns out that um, some ubiquitin chains indeed want to fold up into balls, and then they are much more resistant to cleavage, for example, than it that. So length is important, ubiquitin chain length, and ubiquitin chain types is important. And all of this can can affect up activity. And we've done this. We've done a study here with, with single molecule studies, um, um, pretty early on to to show that they are all breathing and dynamic. Okay, so next concept, and that's a very important one too. Um, how can DOPS work on their substrate? So there's two types. Only thing you need to know, two types. First of all, the DOP recognizes the substrate and cleaves the chain off. Yeah, makes perfect sense. Um, these are substrate-specific DOPS. They don't really care what the chain is. They will just take it off. The second type is that the DOPS find the ubiquitin chains on the substrate. So here, now there's a dub that, that binds to the right chain type and cleaves the chain type off. Doesn't really care about the substrate though. So these are linkage specific dubs. Um, and they basically are regulators of particular ubiquitin linkages globally in the whole cell. So um, as I said, linkage specific enzymes don't care about the substrate. They generate, so they basically will cleave the chain, but they will have probably struggles to keep, cleave the last ubiquitin off. So they might actually generate mono ubiquitinated proteins, um, but they would be good to regulate linkage types globally. Uh, the enzyme that I'm discussing later, Otolin, is really a, a protein for that uh, that regulates linear chains very well, but doesn't do anything else. So some of these classes of DOPs. We have seven classes, and some of them are really in this category of being linkage specific and regulates the system, probably at the global level. And then we have the substrate specific enzymes. And again, these are the ones that recognize your protein of interest and will take all of the ubiquitin off. So they don't care what type of ubiquitin is on there, they will just take it off, um, including the last ubiquitin, and they uh, generate unmodified proteins. This is the ubiquitin specific proteases or USPs. And these enzymes are um, very specific to particular uh, particular um, um, targets and particular um, um, contexts. And then, you know, what's emerging is that we have um, um, specialized enzymes. So this one is shown to cleave mostly um, oxy ester linked ubiquitin chains. Um, UCHs might be cleaving branch chains, but again, this is sort of relatively fresh uh, fresh data. So when I talk about linkage specificity, what do I mean? Here's what I mean. You take all of the ubiquitin chains, run them on a on a diubiquitin on a on a on a SDS page gel. Um, this is the silver stain gels here, and then you can see how they are cleaved over time, and you incubate your chain with a diubiquitinase. And you can see that this enzyme here, USP21, and actually all the USPs, as I said, they don't care about the linkage type. They cleave all of the ubiquitin chains very nicely. This is Otolin. Otolin really cannot cleave, bind or cleave any of the other chain. Up. I'm going to explain to you later how, why this is. Um, but Otolin really only cleaves the linear ubiquitin chains. So um, we were always interested in this family of OTU enzymes. And this is an interesting story because um, um, Tusho um, really um, uh, is, is, is one of my previous students, you know, so imagine you get a phone call, you know, when you're sitting in your office and, you know, I was sitting in my office in, in, in Cambridge and receptionist calls and basically there's a guy to see you. 
And I was like, I'm not expecting anyone. So this guy, you know, little, little young student stands in front of the door and says, you know, I would like to work here. You know, so what can I do to come into your lab as a summer student? Um, sure, why not? You know, so we, we talked. He, he clearly was um, pretty switched on and, and uh, he, he, he arrived as a summer student. And he arrived at a really interesting time because at that time we had cloned and expressed all of these different enzymes. So 16 OTU dubs in humans with an intact catalytic triad. Um, many of these OTU enzymes, um, so we were interested in them because the ones that had been studied, um, and not many of them had been studied, but, but some had, they were all interesting in cell signaling processes, and they had been suggested to be having some kind of linkage preference. So this is their, their, their domain structures. They were relatively small and, and workable and to show uh, uh, really worked with constructs that we had uh, come up with and was able to purify all of these enzymes. Um, and then we were able to show that these are, these are active using these uh, suicide probes. You can see all of them shift up, which means they're all active. So that's good. So we can make bacterial produced OTU, human OTU enzymes, um, all of them um, pretty much. So, Think about the summer internship, right? I mean, Tisho would be working in the lab alongside some of the postdocs. He's a night owl, so he was really working all the evenings and nights together with the Japanese postdocs. That was crazy guys, anyway. Um, basically, you know, they were running these essays every day, a new essay, and every day Tisho was able to show me a gel which effectively looked similar to this. So this is OTU B1, cleaves K40 agent. This, this was all known. We really, really weren't surprised. By this, you know, nobody's ever done this, by the way, because nobody had ever tested all the other chains that nobody else had against OTUB1, right? So that is still lots of really use, unique information on here, but OTUB1 was clearly very K48 specific. Here's O2D1, an enzyme um, that, well, I think, don't think there was any paper on it uh, back then. Um, it was K63 specific. Then, uh, Tushio and uh, another postdoc in the lab, actually, Anya, found that her protein, Cezanne, turned out to be K11 specific. Um, we had O2D3, another enzyme with no protein, uh, no papers attached, K6 and K11. We had Trabit, uh, sorry, this is J1 here, which is a, a P97 associated dub, and that cleaved all of these middle linkages, 29, 27, 29, 33. Um, and Trubit was another enzyme we had been working on already, um, was actually preferential for 29 and 33 chains. And then of course, Otolin came along, uh, Otolin is linear specific. So this is a subset of this data. Yeah, I can, you can immediately see why I put it here because we had a dub for every linkage type. That was pretty cool, right? So he had a really, he had fun. <laughs> and we had a lot of fun with, with what he did there. So now we have all of this data. There are so many questions, right? But let me summarize the best three here. How is this possible? I'll come back to that in a minute. How can the same domain, how can the same domain, small catalytic protease domain, have a completely different preference for different types of ubiquitin chains? Biology, oh great, we have the first enzyme for K6 chains, the first enzyme for K29 chains, right? If you now understand what these do, well, we understand what these chains do. That's a really difficult one, right? And we haven't, you know, this, if it was, I hope it will, uh, this was a really difficult one. We are still working on that one. Um, and tools. Well, actually, this is now a new tool to look at chain topology, chain types. And this was uh, part of this uh, first story that, uh, that Tushio did, where he basically said, um, sorry. This, uh, okay, I didn't realize that. Um, so uh, basically, uh, just to give you one idea of what we've done with this, uh, we've, 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 uh, we've described a method that we call ubiquitin chain restriction analysis, or U, UB, UB quest, um, which allows us to take specific, all of these specific enzymes now and, and go, into, go into real scenarios, real uh, ubiquitinated proteins, incubate them, for example, with a K63 specific dub, which gives only K63, but not linear chains, or with Otolin, which gives only linear chains and not K63 chains. And when you do that, you realize, okay, so here's the ubiquitinated protein. In this case is IRAC1. 
after IL-1 beta ubiquitination, uh, sorry, um, 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 stimulation, you get very nice ubiquitinated IRAC1. AMSH takes all the ubiquitin chains off, right? And you're like, great, so this means IRAC1 is K63 ubiquitinate. But actually, Otolin also takes ubiquitin chains off, but it only takes them off from the top, right? So how does this work, right? Because if Otolin works, it means there's linear chains, AMSH doesn't cleave linear chains, right? So both together work beautifully. Can't take the last one off. Um, so how does this work? Actually, this was the first, oops, sorry. This was the first evidence for, some of the first evidence for hybrid chains, where the K63 chains are modified by Lubak with the linear chains. Right, and these are branch chains. Uh, it's one of the first examples of branch chains that that uh, that that Philip had here. So this was a paper in collaboration with uh, Philip Cohen's lab, and we've done this many other times. Uh, many many people have used this. So how can we use Ubiquest? So that was actually also cool because we actually made a kit, and we we you know gave it to uh, reagent providers. Unfortunately, it has been discontinued because I mean the company doesn't exist anymore either. So you know. Um, I don't think it's because of our kit, though. I mean, I have to say that. I think it's a really nice kit. Um, maybe it's the reason because we also gave everybody the enzymes. So, you know, maybe. We, uh, anyway, so we have all of these enzymes in the freezer. If you ever have a ubiquitinated protein, just come around to us and, and we, we, we figure out what's going on because we can help. So how is this possible? How can these OTUs be so specific? I want to, I want to discuss that um, a little bit. So what does it mean for a duct to be specific? That's O2D2, small OTU domain. That's the protease domain here in blue. Um, two ubiquitins here, right? This one here is what we call the distal ubiquitin. It sits in the S1 side, and that's a boring ubiquitin. That's the one that always looks the same. It sits there. It po pokes the C-terminus. It's always the same into the catalytic side going through here. Here's the catalytic cysteine, and that's where the cleavage happens. So that's a boring ubiquitin. Now the proximal ubiquitin, that is the interesting ubiquitin because that now, depending on which chain type was ubiquitinated, that's the one that has to rotate around to, fix, to basically uh, um, find the right way to poke, into, to poke the right lysine into the catalytic uh, domain. Okay, so this here is the interesting one. Um, so again, this is sort of a bit of nomenclature, S1 and S1 prime sites. Um, and then we basically have the second ubiquitin here, which has all of these different um, um, lysine residues, and that needs to rotate depending on which lysine is deubiquitinated. So how can we do that? So first of all, that's becoming a structural biology question, right? So we were able to solve, so these were structures that were available, and these are the structures that we, we contributed. Um, and um, basically what we were able to come up with is four mechanisms um, of 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 uh, of of, um, of specificity, how enzymes can be specific. I don't want to go into any detail here. Um, I just want to show you uh, one pretty obvious example. So this one here is uh, again, I think OTU D1, which has not only a U OTU domain but also a ubiquitin binding domain. So what's happening here is that this enzyme with the ubiquitin binding domain is K63 specific. When we take away the ubiquitin binding domain, it becomes non-specific. It also becomes much, much less active. You know, now we need much, much more enzymes. So the catalytic activity is there, and it's beautiful. Um, but you put a ubiquitin binding domain on, and suddenly the enzyme becomes specific and super active. Okay, that makes perfect sense. So the ubiquitin binding domain helps put the um, helps put the ubiquitin in in the right place. Um, and this applies to quite a few enzymes um, as well. So let me show you two other mechanisms that I think are really cool. Um, first of all, I want to show you uh, Cezanne. Yeah, so basically Cezanne is an enzyme that, again, we've, we've studied for a very long time. Um, it's K11 specific. The catalytic domain is K11 specific. Um, and we were able to solve crystal structures of Cezanne in all the states of ubiquitin binding. So basically it binds, this is the empty enzyme, it binds to K11 diubiquitin, and then it has a K11, sorry, then it has, it releases a proximal ubiquitin, 
Um, and um, there were two structures in, the, in this uh, crystal form here where we basically had two different conformations of the active site. Um, so let me show you a movie which is going to tell you about large conformational changes. You will see that ubiquitin binding sites are formed and lost in the process of this enzyme being active. And lysine 11 uh, di ubiquitin um, activates the enzyme. So here's the movie. So this is the APO enzyme. This is a catalytic triad here in the middle. Um, and um, this is what we call the cysteine loop. This will move a lot in a minute. Um, there are binding site residues for the S1 prime ubiquitin binding site, but you can see they are really not available. They only become available in the structure with di ubiquitin bound. So there's a massive conformational change when di ubiquitin was bound. Then it sort of kicks out the proximal ubiquitin after the bond has been cleaved, and that leaves one ubiquitin left uh, in the binding site. Then there's a conformational change that effectively uh, opens the cysteine loop so that the, the, this uh, covalent intermediate can be cleaved off again, and that second ubiquitin can be, can be removed. So what are the important messages here? So there's always one really nice ubiquitin binding site, and you can sort of see that the S1 site is rigid and always there. Um, but the second site is really not uh, always there and opposite. The cysteine loop moves back and forth to, um, to, to facilitate that. And um, the uh, S1 prime site undergoes large conformational changes, and that hadn't really been seen in any other dub. Um, um, be, be before. And again, we came up with all kinds of fancy mechanisms, what this all, what this all means. Um, but this was quite a nice, uh, nice way to explain how Cezanne was, was active. Okay, so the second thing then is, um, so here was, here's, a, here's a pub discussion, right? You go to Cologne, you give a talk there, and the, on the day before your talk, they take you out to a pub, and bloody hell, they were really heavy drinkers there. Um, so at some point, Kai remembered that I asked him that. Um, basically, I said, look, you know, have actually all the OTUs been annotated in the human genome, right? Fair question. Um, but you would assume that it had been, but Kai, who's like a fantastic bioinformatician, uh, um, basically said, uh, I can have a look. I mean, I'm sure that they have been, but, you know. So two weeks later, he came back with two names, right? FUM 105A and FUM 105B. Um, FUM 105B should become Otrolin um, uh, and, and basically, uh, you know, a new, a new enzyme and, and, you know, FUM, FUM stands for family of unknown function. So um, a completely undiscovered dub. So it's a linear dub. I already showed you this. It cleaves ubiquitin chains, and it doesn't matter at which concentration. So you can really go to any concentration, and it will only cleave linear ubiquitin chains. How is this possible? Well, we were able to solve crystal structures. Um, um, we were able to get crystal structures of the APO enzyme and then also of the enzyme bound to di ubiquitin, and that really explained how the enzyme works. So let me show this to you in a slightly different way. So basically, this is just a catalytic center now. And what you can see here is that in the APO enzyme, this important catal uh, catalytic histidine residue is actually pulled out of the catalytic site by these upstream charges, this asp aspartate 336. And this um, charge um, is effectively auto-inhibiting the enzyme. So now what we found when we looked at the di ubiquitin bound structure is that the catalytic histidine was firmly put in place. And how was it firmly put in place? Well, it was firmly put in place by the ubiquitin molecule itself. So I said that the ubiquitin has to rotate in order to bind properly. So now here we had a situation where the rotation, only one particular rotation of the enzyme injected this negative charged glutamate 16 of ubiquitin into the active site, and that did two things. First of all, it pushed the histidine into the right position, but secondly, it actually coordinated the catalytic trial. So there's a direct involvement of a residue from the ubiquitin molecule to facilitate the cleavage of the same ubiquitin molecule. And that's what we call ubiquitin-assisted catalysis, and this has been seen a number of times, um, but, um, but this was probably the first, first time. 
So this is nice. We now understand how Autolin is so, so, uh, so linear specific and it only cleaves linear ubiquitin chains. Um, this really was a discovery in my lab where, where, you know, I'm, as you have already figured out, I'm a real molecular person, right? I'm a structural biologist, I'm a biochemist. When we discovered Otolin, this was the first time in my life where I basically said, oh, we really need to make a mouse, right? We really need to understand what's going on here and how important this protein is. Well, and that it is pretty important was actually already shown by this paper that came out uh, with ours uh, um, um, uh, at the same time, because they actually started and they were able, they were unable to make an uh, Otolin knockout um, because it's embryonic lethal. So, you know, yes, it's an important protein. So another thing we found um, is that it, it, Otolin is a linear ubiquitin binding domain and it binds directly to um, um, Lubac. So you heard a lot about Lubac and its complexes in, in Yuri's Wednesday seminar uh, the other week. Um, and I just want to reiterate here that we have this PUB-PIM interaction that Otolin is forming. This is a PUB domain of, of Hoip here. Um, and really, I just want to give you a very brief primer into, into the signaling process, because this is my very ubiquitin centric view of inflammation, right? So um, all kinds of things lead to inflammation and NF-kappa B activation. Lubac is very important here and Lubac and linear chains are very important here. Um, we actually know about this from many, many papers that have been published. Many of them have been published uh, from people in this building. Um, but what is also clear is that if you lose any of the components of Lubac, you start to come down with auto-inflammatory diseases, again, showing that Lubac is very important for inflammation. How about Otolin? What does Otolin do? Um, I do want to, and these are slides I just made a minute ago, uh, I just want to quickly give you a little bit more insight here from a, from a paper, from a figure that, that Yuri made. Um, again, all kinds of different stimuli lead to ubiquitination. And I just want to show you how this is coordinated because there is not just linear chains involved. Um, the first thing that happens is that proteins come together and the proteins that come together include E3 ligases, CIAPs, for example, but also other ligases. And these proteins, and this is what I mean with these gray boxes here, they can be any kind of protein that aggregates comes together, not in a bad way aggregates, <laughs> um, comes together after signaling, right? So this could be your RIP kinases, this could be your, your NOT, uh, your MyD88, your IRAC protein. So all of these come together and trig uh, trigger signaling, which is often going via E3 ligases first. The E3 ligases are important to, for example, bring in kinases, the TAC1 complex. But then the other thing that these E3 ligases do is they bring in Lubac. And Lubac is this um, is, is a linear ligase. And again, I've already showed you that it attaches ubiquitin chains, probably mostly to other ubiquitin chains that are already there. But these ubiquitin chains are very important because, for example, NEMO and the IKK complex has got a binding site for these linear chains. Um, it's not entirely clear how this all goes on, but what is clear is that IKK is very important to phosphorylate I kappa B, which is then also ubiquitinated and degraded so that NF kappa B can enter the nucleus. So this is just my, my quick run through of the, of the signaling pathway. So now, going back to this, what happens when we take away Otolin and we start to make a lot of these linear ubiquitin chains, right? Because now we have um, um, unlimited ubiquitin chains. So how important is Otolin? How important are linear chains here? I already told you that Lubac, if you remove Lubac, you make no linear chains, and that leads to autoinflammation. So you, that's a really, you know, that's the that's question. So what happens when we do the opposite? Well, when we took out Otolin uh, out of just the hematopoietic system, we realized that we had autoinflamed animals. And that was really surprising in a way because conditional knockouts in immune cells um, um, so this really was surprising because, as I said, we basically have have now more linear ubiquitin chains. So this was really a, a very strong uh, a phenotype. Again, same, uh, really a, a fascinating story here um, that I want to quickly mention. Right, we were sitting. I was sitting. Um, I, I, at some point, I get an email from 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 a guy uh, working at Cambridge 
uh, in the hospital. And he basically said, look, you know, we, we have these families and they have uh, all kinds of mutations in genes. And I just realized that you had just named one of the genes that we have a mutation in. And that gene is called FUM105B and you now call it Otrelin. Um, and we have these, this, this family with a very inflammated phenotype, right? So, you know, he came over for a coffee and um, Rune, my postdoc, and, and him, they were comparing phenotypes between mice and humans. And it's like, yeah, we have that too. Yeah, we have that too. So it was just completely, completely crazy. Um, so what happens in these patients when you have no otrelin or mutations in otrelin is that you end up with a lot of linear ubiquitin chains in bloods even, right? Um, and that uh, has, you can see the, the, the phenotypes here, so these are hyperinflammatory phenotypes, but also all kinds of other, uh, um, um, all kinds of other phenotypes. Um, and we really, and our Rune in particular, has really worked through this now uh, very diligently. And here's what we came, here's basically what, what we found and what we came up with. So it turns out that the, the role of Otrelin is twofold. And um, there's two major phenotypes. The first one is you remove Otrelin and Lubac goes unchecked. When Lubac goes unchecked, we effectively have autoinflammation in all the cells. And that leads to, in particular in the, in, in the myeloid cells, that leads to a cytokine storm where, where TNF is released and we get hypersignaling um, from all of these, um, all of these um, um, cytokine responses. In other cell types, and this is something we've, we've, we've seen very early on, when you remove Otrelin, Lubac is downregulated. All of the Lubac complex suddenly goes away too. And that means that these cells can no longer respond to the cytokines properly. And that leads to a induced cell death because the, uh, the, the Lubac complex is very important to keep cells on the road if you want. And now they can't respond to the TNF anymore, properly anymore, and that leads to, that leads to cell death because Lubac is downregulated. So there's a lot going on between um, this visits. So how do we know this is all TNF? Well, actually, the patients are effectively managed and you know cured, to, for lack of a better word, by um, TNF treatment. So they are very heavily responding to infliximab um, and, and anti-TNF effectively um, um, completely reverses all of the phenotypes that, um, that, that they have. So what I'm trying to tell you here, we have a chain type that is very difficult to detect because in normal cells, Otrelin is fully active. There's no linear ubiquitin chains and all of our, and all of you here, hopefully you don't have any linear chains floating around because you would be pretty sick. Um, it's a very important enzyme to, to keep the system in check. If we don't have linear ubiquitin chains, you come down with autoinflammation. If we have too much linear ubiquitin chains, you come down with inflammation. So you can just see how finely balanced the system is that is provided by one ESP ligase complex and one um, and one uh, deubiquitinase. And I didn't discuss, I only discussed a fraction of the data because I'm so running out of time. Um, so Otolin really has, has been uh, um, a massive, um, it's really fantastic to see everybody picking this up. You know, since we described the, the, the protein and when we named the protein in, in 2013, there's now uh, a lot of papers in, uh, since the last couple of years. Um, Otolin has been linked to new pathways. So now we have an angiogenesis phenotype. We've always seen this, or this has always been seen in the mice. Um, and apparently there's like ALK1 is, is ubiquitinated by linear chains. That's a very new pathway, and which I like quite a lot. Uh, it's involved in interferon production. Um, there's genotoxic responses where, where linear chains seem to be playing a role. And then, of course, there's many um, more insights from the animal studies that are now perfectly done by people like Red van Loo and, and Manolis Pasparakis and so on, where they really, you know, take Otolin through their zoos of, of knockout and, and crossing uh, with, with everything they, they have in their, in their zoos of, of mice. What is also cool is that Otolin really is becoming, um, you know, there's some very exciting work done uh, on Otolin in patients, so in ORAS, effectively disease that, that, that we described and named. And you can sort of start to see 
Um, lots of new papers here. Um, um, Sophia has a paper uh, under, where is it? Under revision? Is it? Yeah. Under revision uh, on some Australian autolin mutants. But then also, you know, this was a really cool story because um, this is actually now a, an autolin haplo insufficiency, so just one copy lost. And that actually has got some, uh, some strong phenotypes in, um, in strep, um, uh, Staphylococcus aureus uh, infection. So that is, that is uh, um, you know, another thing we, we, couldn't have, we couldn't have predicted. Okay, so uh, with this, I'm going to wrap up here. I, oh, DOPS are exciting enzymes. We understand how they work. Um, and um, the concepts that I've described to you, they are really across all of the different DOP families and actually probably even going beyond that. Uh, into the ubiquitin system, you know, with all the recognition and so on. I think that's we were able to learn some fundamentals here of the ubiquitin system by looking at this carefully. I've shown you that the human OTUs are linkage specific. We have mechanisms of linkage specificity, um, and they are very nice tools for ubiquitin research. Um, so, what are we doing in the system? Sorry. Um, I just want to sort of give you a, a very brief overview, and I'm, I'm going to stop with this slide here, um, which is, so I haven't talked about this at all, right? But we are working on DOPs, which are able to stabilize proteins in the cell. So imagine we could bring the DOP to a specific protein of our choice. That would allow us to stabilize this protein. So we call this targeted protein stabilization. You've heard of the opposite, targeted protein degradation, a lot because that's protax. Okay, we call our molecule NTAX, and these NTAX are basically able to use DOPs, bring to other proteins, and and um, um, and effectively change the function of that protein, whether it's stabilization or localization. And you know, this is something that we've done. Um, in the last year, um, together with Uli, in the last two years, together with Uli, this is sort of mostly Uli and I and legal lawyer people. Don't ask. Um, but it was a super exciting ride, and I'm super excited to have a fantastic team now um, 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 sitting in Boston, really trying, working on DOPs and, and, and going into this. Super cool. We are very interested in DOP inhibitors in cancer. Um, so you can imagine that if you have a DOP that stabilizes an oncogene, inhibiting that DOP would lead to the normal, would speed up the normal degradation of that cancer gene. And that actually also turns out to be true and seem, it turns out to work. Um, these enzymes are, are, are very good. And we have, for example, enzymes that you know, um, stabilize MYC. And if you, you know, remove that enzyme, you destabilize MYC. And that's a good thing in cancer, right? So this is a very exciting time. As of last year, the first DUP inhibitor, USP1 inhibitor, um, um, has been put in the clinic in breast cancer together with Olaparib. And that's a very exciting space to watch. Um, um, and we have lots of programs going on on DUPs uh, um, and their roles in cancer. And then um, finally, we, we are very much still, um, we're doing lots of things in the lab, but another thing that I want to just mention is because it, these stops as tools are very important. Um, and uh, we are really pushing the limits of what we can do with these clip hazes that I haven't talked about at all. I have another 10 minute of talk, but I'm not going to go through that now. Let me just uh, go to the acknowledgements here. If I can. La, 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 la. Yeah, no, look what you're missing. Um, so I want to finish off by acknowledging uh, a lot of the work that you've heard was, was done in Cambridge, um, where you know, I was working with a fantastic people, uh, both postdocs and students. Um, and you know, I can't give them the credit they deserve, but you can also see from where they are now that you know, they have actually all, all um, I'm super proud of every single one of them and, and uh, super excited for what they are up to now, um, and many of them continue working on DOPs, which is um, interesting. <laughs> um, um, here, the team is, is uh, shaping up very nicely too. You can see these are everybody in the division, but if my my lab here highlighted, and you know the, the people in 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 green actually have some DOP related work. 
Uh, it's not that I don't like the people in black. This is uh, they have some just some other projects, right? So, um, so we, um, and yeah, I think with this, I'm just going to uh, our funding bodies, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. And sorry for going. David, Oops. thank you very much. Um, so Felicia had to run, so I will. Oh, you're back now. Oh, there you. <laughs> thank you, though. Um, thank you again, David, for the wonderful talk. Um, so now, does anyone have any questions? Yep. Oh, okay. Don't have to run. <laughs> Thanks so much. For... <clears throat> Thanks so much for the interesting talk. Um, I had a question about the substrate specific ubiquitinases. So yeah. the latter half of your talk, yeah. you spoke a lot about the chain specific. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So I'm curious because you mentioned that there's a lot less ways to take things off than to put things on. So like yeah. I'm assuming that would manifest in there being less ubiquitinases than more and more ubiquitinases. So I'm curious how we maintain that specificity for the substrate specific ubiquitinators. Fantastic question. Thank you very much. Um, and the answer is we probably don't, right? So um, at the moment, the thinking is that out of the 100 jobs, let's say 20 or 30 of them are linkage specific, the OTU enzymes that I've discussed at length, right? And I'm looking at them more like as general regulators of the whole system, you know, linear chains are down because of OTU. You, you, you got that part right. We have 60 or so USP enzymes, and these are supposed to be the substrate-specific ones. You are absolutely right. How can 60 proteins deal with 60,000 ubiquitination sites? You are absolutely right. And this is the reason why the DUP inhibitors, why we don't have more DUP, good DUP inhibitors and good um, DUP inhibitors in the clinic, because so far we've looked Many of these enzymes have multiple roles in cells. They target multiple different proteins. So they, are, they have more pleiotropic effects than we would like for, from a drug discovery perspective, right? Um, you've seen the, the um, uh, there was one slide in there which was about localization of these enzymes. And localization seems to be very important. So it really seems to be a matter that it's about getting the dub to the right place to then keep that place unubiquitinated, okay? And that's really very, that's how a lot of the thinking goes that it's not so much about protein, protein interaction and protein is degraded, but really it's more, and again, even I think, even in the USP enzymes, there will be um, many which have global roles and might be regulating compartments or, or particular events like stress granules, for example, right, more, more, more globally. We simply don't know. Um, another thing that, so kinases, phosphatases, same story, right? The kinase field has the same problem. The, the way that the kinase people address this to have hollow enzymes, hollow phosphatases, and then lots of different adapters. And we don't understand this yet. So we really don't have enough um, insights into the complexes that dubs form. For some of the dubs, we know fantastic, fantastically beautiful adapters that activate the dub even, right? Things, all of this kind of stuff. So there's some, so the 100 or the 50 enzymes is probably going to be a much larger number if you consider all the complexes they are in and all the kinds of settings they, they, they might be participating. So that's helping you to make it specific. Yeah, love it. But again, um, right now, the, the, the trouble is that whenever we make a super specific top inhibitor and we throw it onto cells, a lot of things happen. Not just one thing happens, but lots of things happen. And that's really then where, you know, USP7 was always going to be a superb drug target because it stabilizes P53 and it does all kinds of really good things. Um, but USP7 is such an important enzyme and it does so many other things where that inhibitor is not going to help that um, that this is really how, how we learn by pharmacology how many on-target toxicity, for example, you have. Like if you really have a great inhibitor, but then you really um, 
you have a great inhibitor, but it actually does things that you don't expect because you don't understand the biology enough. So the ubiquitin field, we are very good at understanding what these things look like, how they work, what they cleave, et cetera, et cetera. Biology, woo, right? Um, and it's really funny. If you go to ubiquitin meetings, there's maybe three or four knockout mice people, right? And knockout mouse people that come to these meetings is like, where are my friends? Right? It's like, why do you not know about what your proteins do? So actually, that's part of the reason why I came to WeHi, right? Because I want to be in a place where the first question is, what does this, what does this thing do? Right? And I think that's where um, we are well placed to understand that for some of the systems. But it's a great question, and you're absolutely right. It's, and I say, um, substrate specific mm. <laughs> depends on how many substrates, right? Thanks. Okay. I'm going to get a better position to start with. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Any other questions in the room? Uh, yep. Um, hi, thank you. Um, I had a question. It might be a bit difficult to answer, seeing as the sort of biological functional mm -hmm. side um, is not as well understood. Um, but I was wondering if, sort of going back to earlier in your talk, when you were talking about the different chains that ubiquitin can form, do you think that different cell types might have a different sort of mm. chain profile? Oh, yeah, great question. Um, Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure they do. Um, so I didn't talk about this, right? But um, right now we are very interested in building up the mass spectrometry to really understand that to the level we should understand it. Okay, and and it's a very difficult question, as you can imagine, because this is not just about trypsinizing everything and you know understanding what kind of ubiquitin chains there are. Um, but it's really about trying to understand what are the ubiquitin chain architectures on particular organelles and so on. And we've, we've done pretty good on that. So, for example, we understand very in great detail what the ubiquitin code of mitochondria looks like. Um, and here, the nice thing is that we know that this is very important uh, um, um, pathophysiologically in, in, in brain and Parkinson's disease. But what was really nice to see is that the, the studies that were done in mitochondria of hex cells were tracking very nicely through the systems to arrive at eye neurons and, and INPCs and all of these kinds of much more biological systems that we can um, um, look at with our um, with our mass spec techniques. So that's nice to that's nice for me that we, you know it's probably okay to do some basic biology uh, in, in 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 standard systems that are highly manipulatable. Um, I so uh, people around me that are more biologically minded, uh, for example, Becky and so on, they're really interested to use our mass spec techniques. So what we need to do, we need to remove our mass spec techniques to a, I don't want to say single cell level, that's really crazy, but to a, to a patient derived cell level and really understand, is there a, chain, a change in ubiquitin composition, in ubiquitin linkages in arthritis, for example, in inflammation conditions, in, you know, in, in cancer, right? What is it that we can then learn from that and I think that's going to be the next thing. And the, the phospho people, the phosphoproteomics people, they've done this extremely well, right? They've, they've taken all their methods and they've really taken them to extremely small sample sizes to go into tumor tissues now and really understand the phosphoproteome of, of particular settings. That's exactly where we are going with some of the methods that I didn't have time to describe um, 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 to you. So I totally expect this to happen. The best example, I've, it's probably Otolin, right? You take out Otolin, you get a massive increase in linear ubiquitin chains. You wouldn't see that if you don't have the tools to look at linear ubiquitin chains, you know? So, um, and we have a nice antibody, so we can immediately check this out. Um, 
but yeah, I think that's that's. Um, I think it's it's a, it's a great question, and and uh, we, I would definitely expect that this is happening. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hi. Thank you, David, for that amazing talk. So I understand that. Um, it's hard to find a biological context for what the chains do. Mm -hmm. And I had a question. Would finding out what induces these writers or erasers, for example, if a specific pathogen induces X kinds of dubs or another pathogen induces Y kinds of dubs, would that help provide context to what the chains do biologically? Why don't you join us and figure that out? <laughs> No, I think it's a great it's a great question. And again, this is not something we have any we, we've we've spent any time on to understand how do disease settings change the amounts of dubs going up and going down, right? And I'm really hoping that I learn from some of you, right? that you come to us and say, look, we have this funny situation and in this particular cancer type or in this particular stimulation of cell X with, with, with cytokine Y, we get this massive increase in this enzyme that we've never heard of, USB 85, right? Doesn't exist, but you know what I mean? So it's really about, um, we do not know, I do not know the the, the, the level of how dubs are regulated on that kind of global level. We started to play a little bit with the bioinformatics teams about, you know, can we depth map profiling, right? Simple things like that. Is there anything in depth map where dubs are upregulated, downregulated, cancer dependencies? As far as I know, nobody's done that. Right. So, and and that sort of tells you a bit about where we are as a field, right? Just like as I said, we're pretty good at understanding what these things look like. Biology is uh, is a little bit more preliminary. Yeah. So there are a couple of questions on teams. Yeah. Um, first one is from Katrina. So thanks, David, for your wonderful talk. I was wondering if people were looking into using Ochulin as a therapeutic for certain anti-inflammatory diseases and how would that look or whether there are too many off-target effects that need to be reduced first? Um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, we have, um, I mentioned this at the end, right, that the whole system seems to be very, very carefully balanced and, and the whole system seems to be um, very much need to be kept in equilibrium. So it is a little bit uh, dangerous, I feel, to put in drugs against Otolin. That's not a good idea. To make an NTAC to bring Otolin to particular inflammatory things. Yeah, that's, that's possibly a very good idea. Um, so, but again, right, this, this, so yes, I think what you what I think what what you have rightly um, identified is an enzyme which is super specific in its role and in its in its activity. So really, this is the kind of enzyme you would want to exploit for a functional outcome. And I think that's why I quite like the idea how to do it. And I've thought about it quite a bit. I'm not sure. And that's that's the trouble. Right, so, um, but it's a great question, thanks. Um, another question from Anna. Um, thanks, David. Regarding the targeted protein stabilization with dubs, how would you distinguish between a mutant protein and its wild type protein that are being stabilized? So let's say affecting the stability of wild type P53 versus mutant P53 in cancers using the dubs. And how would you consider the effects of stabilizing a protein and its interaction with other proteins? Mm -hmm. Super, super question. Um, so there has been quite a lot of, um, um, there, there's been a number of papers and a number of efforts, but we're not the only ones who try targeted protein stabilization. At the moment, the poster child for, for all of this is uh, CFTR. Um, CFTR, cystic fibrosis, is, is caused by a misfolded protein which doesn't get to the right place anymore. 
And importantly, there is a ligand, a small molecule ligand that stabilizes a protein and that basically um, keeps it, uh, brings it, stabilizes the protein and, and sort of helps the, the, the patient to do this. So what people have now shown is that um, if you take CFTR ligand and you fuse it with a dub ligand, you boost the effect of that CFTR ligand a lot because now it's not, you basically prevent the, the cycling of that protein that is a little bit damaged to, to, to do this. Um, so the, 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 the trouble then is that what you need here is a ligand for a protein that does not change the function of the protein, right? So you need a ligand that is not um, interfering, it's not an inhibitor, right? Um, well, that's really difficult because there's not many of these ligands around. Your P53 question is, is great. Uh, it would be fantastic to have something that, that makes P53, but again, we have the same problem um, that it would be really good to have a ligand for wild type P53 that doesn't change function of wild type P53, that we can make more wild type P53. Um, and again, these ligands are very hard to identify and, and, and get. And then the question is, of course, you know, how long is it going to take the cancer to mutate out of it, right? So um, if we mess around with P53. But again, you're thinking exactly on the right lines and uh, I have to be a bit um, careful what I say here because obviously this is, this is all a bit commercially sensitive. Are there any other questions in the room? No? Um, there don't seem to be any more questions in Teams either. So uh, let's give another round of applause for David. Thank you.